In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, we once again want to thank you for another beautiful day you have given each one of us. Today, Lord, you have a wonderful topic for all of us. The law of faith. The law by which each one of us can experience and receive the victory that Jesus has already won for us on the cross. So at this moment, Spirit of God, take complete control of this class. My heart, my mind, my lips, my entire being, nothing of me, everything of you. As we study this word, as we study the law of faith, help us to understand these truths and apply them in every day of our life and receive the victory that Jesus has won for us. We thank you in advance for confirming your word with signs and wonders, for confirming your word with the healings and manifestations of your glory. In the glorious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So brothers and sisters, today we are going to talk about the law of faith. Now, most of you would be asking, what is this law of faith? What really is the law got to do with the faith? Now, just like any law, we need to use it because anyone who violates the law always receives the consequences for disobeying the law. For example, if we know that we are driving in a particular speed limit area, exceeding that limit, there is an there's a chance that we will be fine. We will be able to get a ticket. Maybe the, the cameras will catch our speeds and we will be able to get a ticket. In the same way, if we know that we have to live like law abiding citizens and we tend to do something contrary to what the law says, there are consequences for disobeying the law if we are caught. And in the same way, a law is nothing but anyone who gets involved with it has got to face the same consequences irrespective whether you are tall or short, fat or big, whether you have a status of high status or low status. Let us take, for example, the law of gravity. We know that anything, anything on this earth is subject to the law of gravity. And because of the law of gravity, right now I'm able to sit down. All of you are able to sit down and watch your screen or watch your mobile phone and hear this talk. If there was no law of gravity, we probably would not be able to sit in one place. We would probably be moving or we could be flying. We would not have any stability. And the law of gravity does not respect personages, whether it is the prime minister of a country, whether it is a spiritual leader, whether it is you or whether it is me. If we do not follow or do not obey the law of gravity, we surely are going to get affected. We are going to face the consequences. For example, because somebody is the prime minister of a country, he can't go up a building and jump down and think because he's the prime minister, the law of gravity won't work. The law of gravity will work for every single person, whatever be the status. And therefore, a law is nothing but a principle which anyone gets involved with it will always receive the same result. Let me say this again. A law is nothing but a principle by which if anyone gets involved with it, the result will be the same. So in the same way, just like the law of gravity, if anyone gets involved with it, receives the same result, in the same way, there is what is called as a law of faith. The law of faith is such that if anyone gets involved with the law of faith, the result that he or she will receive or will receive will always be the same. But there is a law, there is a principle. And if anyone is ready or willing to follow that principle of faith, 
he will receive whatever that law ensures or whatever the law provides. Now, many of us know that so many times in our life we have fallen sick. There are times our loved ones have fallen sick. And the law of faith, when applied, we can see the result of healing. Many a times, we, because of our ignorance to this law of faith, we begin to pray. We begin to, uh, you know, do a lot of spiritual exercise. We begin to fast. We begin to offer so many spiritual exercises, rosaries and prayers and, 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 and Eucharistic celebrations and so many things. We ask so many people to pray. And at the end of it, we find that the person who is not well has actually passed away. And why do we say the person has not received healing? Even though we prayed for so long, even though we prayed, the whole church prayed, why is it that the person did not receive? It's only because they did not know how faith works, how to receive when you go applying the law of faith. So brothers and sisters, whether it is healing, whether it is our finances, whether it is our relationship, whether it is anything that we ever require in this life, when we understand that when we apply the law of faith, the result that we will get will always be the same. It will always be victory. It will always be, the result will always be according to what that law promises. So what is the law of faith? The law of faith is what we are going to study as we open our Bibles to Mark chapter 11, verse 12 onwards. So if you got your Bibles with you, please open to Mark chapter 11, and we are going to read from verse 12 onwards. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. So here we read, brothers and sisters, that Jesus was hungry. And he is on his way now to Jerusalem because he had gone the previous day. In fact, if you read verse number uh, 11 and 10, you realize that he was already in the temple, but because it was already late, he had not, he had returned from there. And so the next day, or probably a few hours later, we don't know exactly the time, he is on his way to Jerusalem, to that same place, the same temple. And on that way, he is hungry. Now you must remember, brothers and sisters, Jesus was 100% man. Whatever you and I feel, we feel hungry, we feel thirsty, we feel joy, we feel sadness, we feel excitement, we feel all those emotions. Every emotion that you and I feel, every emotion that you and I experience, Jesus experienced when he walked on this earth. And, this, and the Bible says in verse number 12 that he was on his way to Jerusalem and like any human being, he felt hungry. So he sees a fig tree in the distance and he goes to that fig tree looking for figs because that fig tree had leaves on it. Now, brothers and sisters, we just read that the fig tree had only leaves on it. But when Jesus goes to that fig tree, he finds no figs on the tree. And the, and the word of God says, it was not the season for figs. Now, if you understand the characteristic of a fig tree, especially the fig trees in Jerusalem or in Israel, a fig tree always gave figs before it gave the leaves. Let me say this again. The characteristic of that fig tree is it always gave figs or it even gave figs with the leaves. 
That means if the leaves were there, by default, this fig tree also had to have leaves. Now Jesus see, knows that that fig tree has got leaves on it. And by default, he knows that this fig tree must have figs on it. Now listen, brothers and sisters, we all know different trees. We know mango tree, we know jackfruit tree, we know the trees of strawberries. We know different trees that give fruit. And we know the characteristic of the tree that when we see a tree, for example, a mango tree, a mango tree will always give mangoes in India sometime in the month of February, March, April, May. You cannot be looking for mangoes in the month of September or October because you will never find mangoes in India during that season. But before the mango tree can give mangoes, the mango tree gives flowers. There are flowers that actually spring up on a tree on the branches and you know and you know that in months to come, this mango tree is going to produce the fruit. In the same way, a fig tree had leaves on it, and by default, it must have had also figs. But when Jesus comes to that fig tree, he finds the fig tree has only leaves on it. It has no fruit. This tree was not professing what it really was. It was a hypocrite. This tree was supposed to be giving fruit. The creator had created it to bear fruit. And if it had leaves on it, it must have also given fruit. But when Jesus, the creator, comes to that fig tree, he sees that the fig tree has got only leaves on it and it is not bearing any fruit. It is only occupying space. That fig tree is only occupying space in the ground and it is not doing its job of bearing fruit. Let us read what happens after Jesus sees the fig tree without any fruit. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard. Now here we read, that Jesus goes to the fig tree, he sees no figs on it, and he goes there and opens his mouth and curses that fig tree. And he says, no one will ever eat fruit from you again. That means he is actually cursing that fig tree. It can never bear fruit ever. So he curses it. And at that very moment, the fig tree is dead. Brothers and sisters, I want to dwell on a little while on this particular point. If you open another Bible version, probably the King James Version or probably even the Amplified Version, you will read that when Jesus went to the fig tree and before he actually cursed it by saying, no one shall eat figs from you again, the answer that Jesus gave to the fig tree was in response to a question the fig tree had posed to Jesus. Let me say this again. When the Jesus, the creator, was standing in front of the fig tree, the fig tree was actually challenging the creator by saying, you know what, Jesus? You came looking for figs on this tree. And I'm very sorry to tell you, I have fooled you. You don't, I am not able to give you any figs. The tree did not speak words to Jesus. The fig tree did not speak any audible words to Jesus. But the thoughts that Jesus received when the fig tree had not given any fruit to him was in actual effect, you creator, are not going to get fixed for me again. You have been deceived because I am not bearing any fruit. And when the fig tree, without even speaking a word, perceived, these are the words that Jesus perceived from the fig tree. The, the creator, Jesus, answered the fig tree and said these words. Now, I want you, brothers and sisters, to understand one thing very clearly. 
there are things in our life that do not speak back to us in an audible voice. There are no, there are things in our life which will not open their mouth. For example, when I go to the doctor for a normal checkup, the doctor will give me a report saying that I've got X, I've got Y, I've got Z, I've got some particular sickness in my body. Now that report which the doctor gave me, probably he gave me three or four hours ago, but I am still now at home three, four hours later, still reflecting on what the doctor told me. And as I'm sitting down, tears are rolling from my eyes because the words of the doctor, which were spoken at least three or four or little longer, are now speaking to my mind. And now all the negative thoughts are coming to me. All the negative effects are being played on my mind. And as a result, my response and my reaction and my emotions are actually responding to what the doctor said a long time ago, maybe a day ago, maybe two days ago. And in the same way, brothers and sisters, there are things in our life that may not speak back to us. But as those words keep coming again and again to our mind, they have the effect in order to discourage us to send us into depression, to put us into such a terrible situation. And now, instead of we rising up and walking in victory, we are completely defeated and the battle is lost even before we have got out with our weapons to fight the good fight of faith. Let me say this again with another example. Say, for example, your bank account is showing a very poor balance. Now, is the bank account balance going to speak to you when you have got to pay your fees of your children? You got to pay the rent of your house. You got to pay so many, so much of amount for your groceries and for your day to day living. But when you realize that your bank account details, the, the amount in your bank is actually talking to you. Now you begin to start wondering, you start beginning to, you begin to have thoughts of negativity. You go into depression. Where will the money come? How will be I able to survive? How will I able to manage? And the moment I take my situation and I begin to meditate on it, now I lose the battle, even though I have got all this power within me. Although I am born anew, I have the Holy Spirit within me. I have got this Christ living in my spirit and yet I'm living a defeated life. But look at what Jesus was teaching us today. The fig tree did not have any fruit on it. It had only leaves. And this fig tree thought it was smarter than the creator. It actually did not say words, but what Jesus perceived was that the fig tree had actually made him look like a fool in front of it. And so Jesus, in response to the fig tree, answers the fig tree. That's what we just saw in the King James one. Jesus answered the fig tree and said to it, no one shall ever eat fruit from you again. He curses that fig tree. He sends that fig tree to its final end. And you know, brothers and sisters, if we ever realize that when Jesus does anything or says anything, we who believe in Jesus are called to do the same things that Jesus did. So just as your health report or your doctor's report talks to you, just as your bank balance talks to you, just as your marriage talks to you, just as your relationships talk to you, just as your boss talks to you, or any negative situation in your life talks to you, you also have the same authority like Jesus to curse anything that is come against you, not to curse the people. You don't have to curse people, brothers and sisters, because the word of God says, Jesus cursed the fig tree. He did not curse the person. He cursed the thing. In the same way, you and I have got the same power in Christ to curse our situation, to curse our circumstances, to curse that report and bring that report to a new report with the word of God. And you know, brothers and sisters, when Jesus said to that fig tree, no one shall eat 
fix from you again. He actually cursed that fig tree. Now, let me say to you again, when we know, we have studied that yesterday in Proverbs 18, 21. What does Proverbs 18, 21 says? It says that life and death are in the power of my tongue. Life and death is in the power of my tongue and those who love it shall eat its fruit. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? My victory or my defeat is right below my nose. It's in my tongue. So if I begin to speak death, I begin to speak my situation as I see it. I begin to repeat the words that I hear negatively spoken about me. I am actually speaking death. But even though the report is negative, even though my situation is hopeless, when I open my mouth and speak the word, which is contrary to my situation, contrary to that negative circumstance in my life, now, because I've opened my mouth and spoken my desired result, now I have spoken my faith, my faith is going to bring a new reality, a new circumstance, a new situation, a new health report, because I have like Jesus, I have like God who has made me in his image and likeness, the same power to speak words and to change the situation in my life. Brothers and sisters, when we understand Listen to this very carefully. This truth, if you want to write it down on a piece of paper, please make note of this. The place where I am right now in my life, the place where I am right now in my life is because of the words that I've been speaking all along. What words have I been speaking? What negative words have I been uttering? Those same words are actually manifesting in my life because I do not know the truth. The word of God says in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. It doesn't mean because you don't have that knowledge, you are going to be saved. Because you are made in the image and likeness of God, you have the ability to open your mouth and speak the word. And when you speak God's word with conviction, with confidence, and with faith, every situation in your life will always change. Brothers and sisters, when we understand, when we understand that life and death is in the power of my tongue, and where I am in my life right now is because of the words I'm speaking, the good news that I want to give you today, according to God's word, is... If I want to reach the place where God has destined for me, where God has planned for me, we know that Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I alone know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for your disaster, plans for that future that you hope for. If I want that plan to come in my life, the good news is I need to change the words that I am speaking. If I can change the words I'm speaking, if I have been speaking always death over my life, there are so many of us who are also going to church, those who believe in Jesus, they have been speaking death over their children. When they get a bad result coming from their children, they go and tell their children, you are a duffer, you are an idiot, you are good for nothing, you are absolutely useless. And only when they come with good results, they give them a pat on the back. But brothers and sisters, even though we receive the bad report, even though our child comes back from school with a bad report, if we are going to open our mouth and speak to our child contrary to what their result says, if we open our mouth and speak exactly the opposite by saying to our child, yes, you can do it, you are good, there is nothing that you cannot do. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I tell you, brothers and sisters, the report of your child will surely change. I want to share you with, us, with uh, uh, my own personal testimony. My own son, my own son, when he was in the KG, 
he was able to not he was not able to study he was distracted in this first year at school he used to get out of 10 digit marks one two three he used to he used to always be at the bottom of the class and you know brothers and sisters my wife and i what we did was every time we received a bad report from him we would always tell our son son you are very good this is not this report is not reflecting who you really are you can do it if you can dream it you can do it and we kept on encouraging him at that early age of five of speaking the word from isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 and we taught all our three children to speak the word Thank you, Lord, that you have given me the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, might, the fear of the Lord. And then we added 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, and said, you have the mind of Christ. And at a very early age, we began to ask our children every time they went to study, every time they would start their studies, to confess this word. Thank you, Lord that you have given me the spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, might, the fear of the Lord, and the mind of Christ. And as they kept confessing that all their school life, brothers and sisters, our children began to do very well in their academics. It was not because they were too intelligent, but they received the wisdom of God. They received all that they required from the Lord. And our son, who started off with getting digit marks, as the months began to pass by, by the end of the year, he was getting marks like nine out of 10, 10 out of 10, and his result had absolutely changed from where he started because we refused to speak what his marks said. We refused to discourage him and, and, and virtually curse him by saying the negative words but we began to confess the word and we made our children confess the word. And now when we see their result, we see how they have performed. We can only glorify our God and glorify his word because his word is always true. And so brothers and sisters, today when we listen to that word which Jesus said to the fig tree, he curses the fig tree. Why does he curse the fig tree? Because that fig tree was professing something different than what it really was. And you know, brothers and sisters, there is one thing that the Lord cannot tolerate. There is one thing that he will never accept. And that is a lukewarm person. You either are hot for him or you are cold for him. If you're cold for him, you're not with him. If you're hot for him, he expects you to get hotter by the day. But anyone who's lukewarm, anyone who's just there only for purpose of, you know, going through just a, a, like, like sort of a ritual or just go through an exercise, he does not accept them. And he just wants to spit you as out from his mouth. And therefore, this fig tree was actually not professing what it was supposed to do. It had leaves on it. It had to have figs on it, but it was a fig tree. It was a hypocrite. It was not professing what it really was. And when the creator saw this fig tree, what does he do to it? He curses it and the fig tree, that very moment dies from the root. You know, brothers and sisters, if you read the version in the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, the same parable or this, not the parable or the same incident, it says when Jesus cursed the fig tree, the fig tree withered instantly. But we are going to find out in Mark chapter 11 that Jesus walks along and when he comes the next day, he sees the fig tree has been withered from the root. Let's go further with this gospel from to verse number 18. We are not going to take we are going to take a gap between because Jesus, Jesus was up to, up to 20, up to 19. Jesus had gone from after cursing the fig tree to the temple at Jerusalem. But in verse number 20, Jesus is returning after going to the temple, after doing the cleansing of the temple. And he's coming by the same route. He came the previous day, 
where he had cursed the fig tree. And let us see what happens to that same fig tree, which was proudly looking at its creator. It had only beautiful leaves on it, and there were no fruit on it. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree wither the way to its roots. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, the fig tree the previous day had leaves on it. Next day, the same fig tree has withered from the roots. In 24 hours, not a chopper, not a knife, no physical sharp instrument has been used on the fig tree. The creator has only spoken words. He has cursed the fig tree with his words. And the word of God says that the next day when Jesus was passing by, the fig tree had withered from the root. Now, I want to ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, the leaves of a fig tree are meant for the tree. Every leaf that is there is meant for the tree. The fruit that a fig tree or any fruit tree bears are always for others. And so, if the tree is not bearing fruit, that means this tree is not doing what it's supposed to do. And therefore, when we go to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 5, we have actually dealt with that last week because we have been going through chapter 14, 15, and 16 in the last two, two weeks, the last discourse between Jesus and his disciples. So let us go to John chapter 15, verse 5, where Jesus is talking about he being the wine and we being the branches. And he talks about we bearing fruit. So let us read John chapter 15, verse 5, and see what Jesus says about bearing fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing, says Jesus. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall bear much fruit. And the reason why you and I, brothers and sisters, are on this planet Earth is only to bear fruit. If we are bearing fruit, then we are doing what the Creator has put us on this planet to do. Let us ask ourselves, are we bearing fruit? And if we are bearing fruit, what fruit are we supposed to bear? Is it that we are supposed to bear figs and oranges and apples and pomegranates? And then we, when we all come together in a class like this, we all mix together and have a good fruit salad with ice cream. Is it that what Jesus is talking about? Absolutely not, my brothers and sisters. When the Lord is talking about bearing fruit, he's talking about bearing fruit of the Spirit. And that is exactly what is mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. I'm not going to read that and I'm not going to go in detail. But in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the word of the Lord says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. And you know, brothers and sisters, anyone who's bearing fruit, the law does not apply to them. The law does not condemn them. The law will never come against such a person because a person who's bearing fruit of the Spirit is operating in agape love, is operating in unconditional love, is operating in God kind of love. And that is exactly what you and I who are abiding in Christ are supposed to bear. We are supposed to walk in agape love. We are supposed to walk in unconditional love, not on our own strength, but with the strength 
of the Holy Spirit living within us. Because the word of God says in Romans chapter 5 verse 5, it says the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we truly have the Spirit of God living within us, we have the word of God abiding within us, we surely are going to bear the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Many a times, many a times, and including I'm going to give my own example, which I've shown, which I've told you before. I have served in the church. I've served in different capacities, but the Lord showed me one day what a hypocrite I was when he told me all that you are doing is only to glorify yourself. Everything is about you. But the day the Holy Spirit revealed to me that whenever I serve him, it has to be always to glorify my God. It is always to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is very clearly given in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. And brothers and sisters, when you and I are bearing the fruit of the Spirit, there is no need for us to even open our mouths and, and start proclaiming the word. There is no need for us even to say a word because the moment we are giving out the fruit of the Spirit, we are actually drawing others towards us. Just like the, honey, the bees get attracted to the honeycomb. In the same way, when we bear the fruit of the Spirit, those without Christ and those who are on the border, they will be attracted to Christ in us. We don't want people to be attracted to us as a person, but they are attracted to that Christ who is living within us. And brothers and sisters, it is only when Christ is who is living within us, the Holy Spirit that is living within us, that we can truly bear the fruit of the Spirit. And so, in verse number 20, when Jesus comes back the next day and is passing that same route, he sees the fig tree has withered away from the root. And you know, brothers and sisters, the fig tree died that very moment Jesus cursed it. But the word of God says it had withered away right from the root. So when Jesus cursed the fig tree the previous day, it was at that very moment the fig tree died from the root it stopped receiving any nutrition from the ground but what was visible to the eyes was only visible the next day because as the sap and as the nutrition began to be cut off from the root the tree slowly but surely was visibly withered right to its top and in the same way brothers and sisters you and i can curse any situation any circumstance in our life which is coming against us because there is nothing i want to say this again and please write it down in bold letters there is nothing that our good lord will ever bring against his children there is nothing evil that our good lord will bring against his children in order to make us change he does not need to use the tools of heaven of hell in order to change his children so therefore sickness poverty or any sort of negative circumstances be it our marriage be it our children be it anything negative in our life is not coming from the lord that we need to tolerate it we need to entertain it but we need to curse it in the name of jesus and destroy it because it is coming from the kingdom of darkness and it is coming from the pits of hell and therefore we have the authority like christ to curse that Health, that bad report. We have the authority of Christ to curse our, our negative situation and receive what Jesus wants to give us. A new reality, a new truth, which is nothing but the blessings that he has already prepared for us when he said it is finished on the cross. Let us go further as we read verse number 21. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Now look at Peter, because we read on the previous day when Jesus cursed the fig tree, his disciples heard it. In verse number uh, 12 onwards, when we read, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, his disciples heard it. 
And so the next day, when they are passing by, Peter is surprised. Peter is reminding his master, he's saying, Jesus, the fig tree that you cursed yesterday has withered from the roots. For Jesus, it was not a surprise because when Jesus cursed the fig tree, he knew and he knew that the end result was that the fig tree was dead. He had cursed it. It had to die that very moment. But for Peter, it was a big surprise because Peter had seen the fig tree with leaves on it. But the next day, he's actually drawing Jesus' attention. He's saying, Master, the fig tree that you cursed has withered from the roots. He's surprised, but not Jesus. And in the same way, brothers and sisters, when you and I curse that particular situation, curse that cancer, curse that diabetes, curse that sickness which has come against us in the name of Jesus, we should know when we open our mouth and speak death over that sickness or death over our negative situation. It has happened that very moment if we are ready to believe what Jesus is teaching us today. He said it because he did this only to teach us how to operate according to the law of faith. So when Peter tells Jesus, look, Lord, the fig tree that you cursed yesterday has withered from the roots. What does Jesus say to him? Let us read that in verse number 22 and let us go and read till the end and then let's break it down and find out the secret of the law of faith. Jesus answered him, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up, and thrown into the sea. And if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, Forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. So here we read, brothers and sisters, in verse number 22, when Peter draws Jesus' attention to the fig tree, Jesus says, have faith in God. That's what Jesus says in verse number 22. He says, have faith in God. So what was Jesus saying when he said, have faith in God? He said, just the way I cursed that fig tree, just the way when I opened my mouth and spoke the words, and it happened exactly as I spoke, in the same way, if you can do the same things, you also shall receive. And you know, brothers and sisters, a person of faith can never be silent. Let me say this again. If you have faith in God and if you have faith in Jesus, the words that you are speaking will confirm whether you are in faith or whether you are in fear, whether you are in believing or you are doubting. And you know, this is one proof that shows us whether we really believe in the Lord or we do not believe in the Lord. When we see a particular situation, when we see a particular circumstance in our life, when we see the negative reports in our life, are we going to confess exactly what we see? Or are we going to confess what the word of God says? Let us ask ourselves this question, because brothers and sisters, our situation and our circumstances can never be greater than the word of God. I want to say this again. Our situation, our circumstances, our negative reports can never ever be greater than the word of God. Because the word of God says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess in heaven, on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. So there is no name there is no word, there is no person 
who is greater than Jesus. So no circumstances in our life can ever be greater than Jesus' name. And so when we understand that when we have a negative situation in our life, we have a negative circumstance in our life, that when we have the word of God, we can speak the word by opening our mouth and bring a new reality to pass. And so Jesus speaks about in verse number 23, he says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, he is talking about not talking about the mountain, but speaking to the mountain. Remember brothers and sisters, we are not supposed to talk about our situation. We are not supposed to talk about our problem. We are not supposed to talk about our sickness, but we are supposed to talk to the sickness, talk to our situation, talk to our problem because most of the time we are going to God with talking our, about our situation. And here Jesus is teaching us that we need to talk to our problem and tell our problem that our God is so great. I want to raise this up again, brothers and sisters. When we understand that the, no situation in our life is greater than the word of God, and we have been created in the image and likeness of Christ, we can open our mouth and speak to our problem and command that problem to get out of our life in the name of Jesus. And that's exactly what he says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, you need to be very specific. You need to be absolutely focused. You can't make any general uh, request or make a general prayer. You need to be very, very, very specific. So whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Now, brothers and sisters, what is doubting in the heart and doubting in the mind? Because the word of God says he shall not doubt in his heart. We can have a doubt in our mind because we can always see the situation around us. Our senses will always give us a doubt in our mind, but never should we ever doubt the word of God. Because when we doubt the word of God, we are doubting in our heart. So we never doubt the word of God. It is, it is possible we could have a doubt in our mind, but with the word of God, we can bring this mind by renewing it and bring it in agreement with the word of God and agreement with what is in our heart and in our spirit. So whosoever shall say unto this mountain. So the first principle of the law of faith is to speak to the problem, say. And that is exactly we hear three times in the book, in the, in the verse 23, the word say. So we need to open our mouth and speak to the problem. So we, the first principle of the law of faith is speaking to the problem. Write it down. The first principle of the law of faith is speak to the problem. Then it says, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. The second principle of the law of faith is believing because when I believe what I'm saying, only then will what I have said shall come to pass. That's why it says, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Blank check, brothers and sisters. So if you have been saying, I have got diabetes, I have got heart problems, I have got coronavirus, I have got asthma, you will have what you say. But if you don't say what you have, but you say what God's word says, then you will have what God says and you will not have what you have because what you have shall only be temporary. And so brothers and sisters, the first principle of the law of faith is speak to the problem, believe what you have said. Verse number 24, then it says, and when you stand praying, when you stand praying, what does it say? Believe that you have received it. When you stand praying, believe that you have received it. The third principle of the law of faith is receiving. Receiving becomes the third 
principle of the law of faith. And brothers and sisters, if you and I have received it, you may not have received it physically because when you pray, you have received it in the spiritual realm. And between the spiritual realm and the physical realm, for it to manifest, it could happen instantly, it could happen over a period of time, but you know and you know that when you said that prayer and you said amen, you know that you have received it. And so if you have received it, you are going to open your mouth and start thanking the Lord. So the fourth principle is thanking. So the first is speaking. The second one is believing. The third one is receiving. And if we have received it, we are going to thank the Lord. And thanking becomes the fourth principle. Verse number 25. And it says, and when you stand, forgive those who have anything against you. Or if you have anything against anyone, forgive them from your heart. And so the fifth principle becomes forgiving. So brothers and sisters, if we have unforgiveness in our heart, unforgiveness becomes the block to receiving anything from God. And therefore, forgiving, I usually always pray before we do step number one, two, three, and four. So in, in our way of praying, we must always begin this way. Forgiving, speaking, believing, receiving, and thanking. And there we get the law of faith, brothers and sisters, by following these five principles. So just as the law of gravity allows any human being or anything on this world to operate by coming to the ground because of that law of gravity, because of that force that pulls it down. In the same way, if anyone operates by forgiving, speaking, believing, receiving, and thanking, they are operating according to the law of faith. And any person operating according to the law of faith will always receive the same result. Let me say this again. Every person who operates according to these five points, which is the law of faith, will always receive the same result, no matter who you are, because the word says, whosoever shall say. So whosoever gets involved in the law, whosoever gets involved in the law of gravity, whosoever gets involved in the law of faith will always receive the same result. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is important for us to follow the law of faith and receive the victory when Jesus said it is finished from the cross. And when we operate according to the law of faith, we receive everything that Jesus has already done for us. And so today, when we come back, we are going to demonstrate these five principles in anybody's life and experience that healing, experience that change in our circumstances, experience that change in our situation, and experience the victory and receive it, what Jesus has done for us. Let us pray. Loving Father, thank you so much for teaching us the law of faith today. Your word says, that when you walked on this earth, you spoke the word. And you spoke the word with authority. You spoke the word with confidence. You spoke the word with power. And every word that you spoke manifested in signs and wonders. It manifested the glory of the Father. And today, brother, Lord, you have given each one of us that same authority in Christ. That when we speak to our problem, with authority, with power, with faith and with confidence, we too can receive everything from the Father in heaven in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for giving us the understanding of the law of faith. And we thank you for giving us the confidence to apply it every day of our life and receive the victory in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen.